when it comes to Microsoft Flight Simulator 2024, your Wi-Fi and network setup is one of, if not the most crucial part of this puzzle. Get this wrong and everything else falls apart, especially in VR. And you can see from this footage here, with poor network setup, it's going to be pure stutters. So this is part 5 of our series, the most overlooked settings in VR. If you haven't seen parts 1 through 4s yet, you may want to check those out. But in this one, I'm going to show you exactly how I have my Wi-Fi and network set up. What you absolutely need to get right and why your performance issues might have nothing to do with your rig, but everything to do with your router. So let's dive right in. And first up, let's start with the one thing that absolutely has to be right. Your PC must be hardwired, no exceptions. If your PC is running on Wi-Fi, even good Wi-Fi, you're introducing delay and instability before the data even reaches your headset. VR streaming needs a clean, consistent pipeline, and that starts at the source. Then you need to make sure that you're using proper Ethernet cables, at least CAT6, not some leftover cable from 10 years ago. If you get CAT6A or CAT7, even better. These are going to give you the bandwidth and shielding that you need to avoid noise and drops. You also need to make sure that any switches or anything like that that you're using in your network is rated for at least one gigabyte per second ideally 2.5 gigabytes per second by all means 10 gigabytes per second if you're really pushing high vr bit rates and that also goes for any usb-c adapters if you're using a some type of ethernet adapter that has to also have that same high rating one gigabyte per second minimum 2.5 ideal 10 gigabytes a bit overkill, but hey, why not? Now let's talk about your router. Think of your router as a highway. The bandwidth is how many lanes you've got. More lanes means more data can move at once. The data itself is like the cars, each one carrying frames, textures, audio, everything your VR headset needs to keep up. But here's the thing, even if the car is fast, it doesn't help if the road is narrow, full of traffic, or loaded with potholes. That's when you hit lag and stutters. And if you're using a mesh system or a complex network setup, it's like your GPS keeps rerouting the car, taking detours through side roads that slow everything down. That's why we don't just need speed, we need a clear, direct route from your PC to your headset. So ideally you want a dedicated router, something that's not overloaded with other devices chewing up the bandwidth, like smart TVs, phones, your kids' iPads, your wife's laptop, you get the picture. And the placement is gonna matter a lot too. Your router and Quest 3 should be in the same room. If, it's, if the router's in another room, upstairs or behind a wall, you're gonna be losing signal strength. As for the router type, at a minimum, you want a solid 5 gigahertz setup, but if you have access to 6G or Wi-Fi 7, that's even better. Just remember, higher bands like 6 and 7G offer more speed, but less range. So placement becomes even more critical in that situation. Also, I could be wrong, but I don't think the Quest 3 actually supports Wi-Fi 7 but I don't think it will hurt to use it. It will just kind of default to 6 gigahertz, even if it's on a 7G ban. Then you also have to be aware that just because you bought a Wi-Fi 6E or Wi-Fi 7 router doesn't always mean that you're going to get to utilize those bands because in some regions, the firmware locks that option out due to regulations. And I found that out the hard way. I only have access to 5G even though I bought a Wi-Fi 7 router. All right, so here's a look at my actual router. Now yours might look different, but whatever firmware you've got, the goal is the same. 
I want you to set up a dedicated five gigahertz or better band, give it a unique name, and I want you to lock the channel manually. We're going to use a 160 megahertz width if that's available. And you need to disable Smart Connect or band steering so your Quest doesn't get kicked to the wrong band. All right, so Wi-Fi settings, general tab. This is where we configure the actual Wi-Fi signal the Quest 3 will connect to. We're setting the right band, channel, and bandwidth to make sure your headset gets a fast, stable connection with no interference. Now, just to be clear, this 2.4 gigahertz band I've highlighted at the top, we're not using it at all for this setup. The goal here is this router should be dedicated to the Quest 3 alone, and that means five gigahertz or better and nothing else. Okay, so under the five gigahertz section, we've got the channel bandwidth set to 160 megahertz, which is the widest option available here. That means more data can flow between your PC and headset, less compression, lower latency, and overall smoother performance. If your router and headset support it, this setting gives you the best shot at high quality VR. Now let's talk about the control channel. This is where you manually lock the frequency your 5G band will use. Now I've selected 112, which falls under what's called a DFS channel. That stands for dynamic frequency selection. And DFS channels are usually less crowded and can offer better performance, but they do come with a downside. If radar activity is detected on that frequency, the router is legally required to switch to a different channel, and that can cause your Quest 3 to stutter or disconnect. And DFS channels typically range between 52 and 144. So if you want maximum stability for VR, you may want to switch to a non-DFS channel instead. And those channels range from 36 to 48 and 149 to 165, depending on your region. So again, these non-DFS channels are not affected by radar. So your router won't suddenly switch channels mid-session. That makes it much more stable for VR, especially for something like Microsoft Flight Simulator where a disconnect will ruin the whole experience. The trade-off is that non-DFS channels are more commonly used, so they can be more congested, especially in apartments or dense neighborhoods. But if you've seen random stutters or drops, stability always wins, and non-DFS may be the safer choice for you. Then extension channel is set to auto, and really on that drop box, there's no other option for me. It's, it's forcing me to select auto. Okay, so the professional tab really is you know, the tab that we're going to focus on in this section. It has a few advanced settings that could make a real difference in the VR stability. And right to the top of the list, we're going to make sure and select 5Gs. So we make sure we're editing this band right here. Then we enable radio. This needs to be on. It keeps this band active. Then enable wireless scheduler. No, we have to keep this disabled because otherwise your router may turn off during a session. Roaming assistant, we want disabled. We turn this off so that the quest doesn't get kicked around looking for a stronger signal. We want that locked in. Wireless mode, safe to leave that on auto. It will default to the best supported mode. Wi-Fi Agile Multiband, definitely disable this. This is what would allow your automatic band switching, which we definitely don't want. Then target wake up time, we leave that on. It helps with power efficiency and performance syncing. IGMP snooping, definitely want this enabled. And as far as I understand it, this just helps your router send the right data straight to the Quest 3 instead of spraying it everywhere. So we definitely need to leave this enabled. 
multicast rate. I have it set to the maximum of OFDM54, and this is supposed to help with consistency in delivering the packets. Moving right along, the AMPDU RTS. We leave that to enable. Now, while I really don't know what that stands for, my research shows that it's supposed to improve performance on the load, which is gonna be very useful for heavy data like VR, so it's enabled. Then we have RTS threshold, and 2347 is the default value. I don't really know what this does, so I just leave it at default, and, any, and I do that for everything in this section that I haven't researched fully. If I don't know what it does, I'm just gonna leave it to whatever the default was. So DTIM interval set to one, and this is gonna make sure that your router talks to the Quest more often, and that helps keep things in sync and prevents little hiccups in the stream. Then we have beacon interval. This controls how often the router announces itself to nearby devices. 100 milliseconds is the sweet spot, not too frequent, not too slow, so we're leaving it right there. TX boosting. This helps a router send more data at once without waiting between each piece. For streaming VR to the Quest, that means smoother performance with fewer hiccups, so we want to leave this on. Then we have WMM, this has to be kept on. Uh, Wi-Fi multimedia will prioritize VR traffic like audio and video. Then the WMM no acknowledgement, we wanna disable that and it's gonna ensure more reliable packet delivery and reduce our chances of missing frames. Next up, WMM APSD. Now this is a power saving feature. And I don't know why I have it enabled, but we don't want that for VR. We need consistent uninterrupted data flow. So I'm gonna turn this off to avoid any chance of delay or stutter. I don't think having it on makes a big difference to be quite honest, but optimally I would want this off. Then we have optimize AMPDU aggregation. Quite simply, this boosts the throughput by bundling packets together. We're gonna keep it on. It helps send more data at once, which is ideal for streaming. Next up, modulation scheme. So this controls how the data is actually encoded. And MCS 11 is the highest supported for Wi-Fi 5. I mean, choose the max or best speed and performance that you have on your firmware. Airtime fairness, definitely want to turn this off. This tries to balance access across multiple devices, but we're really dedicating this network to the Quest 3 exclusively, and we want it to use all the airtime it needs. We don't want it to share with anything else. Then we have multi-user MIMO, and from my understanding, this lets the router handle multiple streams at once. Even if the Quest 3 is the only device enabling the MU, MIMO can help with smoother data flow. Next up, the OFDMA, blah, 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 whatever it is, we have DL slash LU, OFDMA plus MU, MIMO. A whole lot of letters that I don't quite understand, but from my research, this is the best setting which allows the efficient use of bandwidth in both directions and it helps with latency and bandwidth delivery during your VR sessions. Then we have Wi-Fi 7 OFDMA, and I have selected the DL annual option for this, and my understanding is that it optimizes how data is sliced up and sent, and it's supposed to help with your latency. All right, so now the Wi-Fi 7 MUMIO, and Really, I mean, I'm just kind of being redundant here and, and making sure to cover all my bases. I don't even think that the Quest utilizes Wi-Fi 7, and I don't even have the option to really set up that band here, but I'm just putting everything in the most optimal settings regardless. So this one will definitely also be DLUL. Then we have the beam forming. We're gonna keep that enabled. It improves the signal strength and direction towards the quest, so we wanna keep that on. Then the universal beam forming, we're gonna keep that enabled as well, somewhat as a safety net, because 
it also improves signal um but especially for those devices that don't support newer standards so we want to keep that enabled then the last one is the tx power adjustment and we want to set that to performance because it's going to boost the signal strength and that's a wrap for part five in part six we're going to be diving into windows and bios settings to push things even further the link for that will be on screen in just a moment but don't forget in part seven we're covering all the in-game settings and in part eight we've got some really cool bench testing and bonus footage lined up so thanks for watching and i'll see you in the next one